Welcome to the High Voltage Seminar. This is the introduction to EMI and power supply design. Session being presented by Bing Glu. My name is Odai El Smadi. I will be your moderator for this session. All participants are muted for this session. Please use the chat function to ask questions and address it to everyone. We will be answering questions throughout the webinar in the chat. Also chat if you are having any problem hearing or seeing the presentation. With that, I will hand it off to Bing to get started. All right, thanks, Odai. Um, good morning, good uh, afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thanks for attending this session. So uh, this session, I'm going to uh, do present introduction to EMI in power supply designs. So uh, this is a very uh, basic um, course. I would call it a course. Um, so there is not ICs introduced as more of a fundamental concept about EMIs and EMCs and uh, other designs. So let's get started. Um, <clears throat> here's the outline of this presentation. First, I'll give a very brief introduction to EMI and EMC, and then discuss the EMI standards and uh, how to measure the EMI. Um, based on the measurement, we can um, separate the noise because, uh, based on their properties called the differential mode and common mode EMI noise, and we'll discuss their source, path, and their spectrum. And later, I'll talk about the EMI filter design and their uh, EMI filter and their design considerations. Uh, and last, I'll introduce some other EMI mitigation methods. So, um, because it's a relatively fundamental course, so I'd like people getting more interactive. So, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, type your question in the chat. I'll try to answer as much as I can uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so first, so let's talk about EMI and EMC. So we, we hear these names all the time. People say, hey, I have a bad EMI. I, I, I need to design for EMC. What does EMI and EMC stands for? So the EMI really uh, stands for uh, electromagnetic interference. So um, you can you can feel that name because it's interference. Is is I, I like to use the word. Offense, so it's like attack other other equipment, so so that you you need to control the your your EMI. So basically, you don't attack other equipments. For example, uh, the equipment should not interfere with other system. Give an example, say turning on your ACDC power supplies should not interfere with your radio, so you shouldn't hear anything strange from your radio. So that's that's the basic concept of. EMI. And what is EMC? The, <clears throat> the EMC stands for electromagnetic compatibility. It's really <clears throat> more of an offense so that the equipment should operate normally even with the interference from the noise. Uh, give an example here so that you, your power supply, your ACDC power supply or whatever the power supply you design should operate normally in a noisy environment, say in a motor drive or in a heavy machine operate around you. So so you, you have that experience, say once your, your, your phone started contact with the tower, your your speaker started making noise. That's the EMC problem, say the speaker shouldn't pick up that and uh, cause extra noise. So so that'll give you a, a basic concept of EMI and EMC. I I often hear people talk about EMI and EMC um interchangeable is, is, is you really want to, to focus on, on what is your EMI, what is your EMC, so make it clear. Okay, so, <clears throat> so in this course, we'll mainly focus on the uh, EMI, not the EMC, so try to control the noise created by a power supply. So EMI challenges in power supply designs. So the EMI is a challenge for all, all electronic systems. So, so generally the EMI, we can consider three uh, main um, components, say the, the EMI source, uh, EMI source, what is creating the EMI, and then the coupling path, how the EMI is transferred through the system and get to the other, to, to, to the guy who receive it, then the receptor. So, so who receives the EMI? So, so normally we separate the EMI noise by two categories, either called conductive 
conductive EMI, so the conductive through the cabling or PCB traces, so so that's conductive, and then there is radiative, so that things travel through the L. Say for example, you 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 create electromagnetic fields that transfer your EMI noise all over the place. Um, so <clears throat> you will you will see a different EMI standards called different uh, uh, conductive and radiative uh, frequency range. So typically, the conductive and the radiative has a different has a different range. So that, give an example, the EN55022, that it's, it's, it's specified the conductive EMI range is between 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, and then he specified the radiated EMI range from 30 megahertz to one gigahertz. So, <clears throat> so that's how the how the standards go out. It doesn't mean the conductive EMI stops at 30 megahertz or radiative st st stars at 30 megahertz. So they they can be any frequency they like to be. So so uh, when you design your 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 power supply here give an example that a power supply. So you often can see that you will put a lot of tools around your your design, trying to mitigate your EMI challenges. So something like uh, um, you will put a careful e uh, PCB layout, trying to trying to minimize your EMI from the source, and uh, trying to use some uh, control methodology from your IC to get better EMI or you see all those components around the boards, um, so-called EMI filtering. So say, I couldn't control the source, at least I can control how much this EMI is transferred to other systems, so I can use a filter to fill them out. So that's another thing. So often when you design a power supply, you do not want to do these things in the last minute. So basically, we design a power supply has to put all these components considerations at the beginning of the design instead of at the end of the design so that you get a better chance to meet your EMI requirement. Okay. So here um, I give one example of EM55022. It's also see IEC, uh, IEC the same same standards and you also see the uh, people call CISPR, so, so you will see different EMI standards. So while you're working on a power supply and the, the generally there is a requirement for specific uh, standard and uh, you can you can come up with the standard. So so in this particular standard for the conductive emission, so it, it calls out different things like a cl class A, class B, quasi peak and average um, frequency range. So through this uh, presentation we'll explain um, every concept of uh, of this what does this mean? So in class A, so that's specified for heavy industry. So you can see the uh, the standard has two different curves and uh, uh, drawing in a log scale uh, in the frequency range. So if you look at the um, that's for the heavy industry, and then on the right hand side for the class B, so that's for the uh, residential, commercial, light industrial, and uh, for example, your your uh, personal computer and your notebook adapters, your phone adapters are all falling to this one. So, so let's use this one as an example of uh, how you uh, how you see this uh, this picture. So in the X axis. That specify the noise frequency in the scale uh, in the log scale. So so it says from 150k to 30 megahertz. So you can see the lines starts from 150k and stopped at 30 megahertz. And then the y axis is the noise amplitude in the units of dB microvolts. Later we'll explain what does dB microvolts mean. So at this moment let's call that the amplitude. So you will have two lines. So the red line called quasi-peak and the blue line called average. So you see these lines tells you at certain frequency your noise amplitude has to be below its, its threshold. Normally when we do a power supply because of the component to component variations and the manufacturer tolerances, so normally we like to, to see your measurement has a few dBs below the threshold so that we have some design margin. So we see we see people do leave somewhere between three to six dBs of design margins. 
Okay. So how do we um, how do we measure the uh, the noise and uh, what does those uh, amplitudes really mean? So so the EMI noise is measured through a, a device called the Line Impedance Stabili uh, Stabilization Network, or, or short for LISTEN. So, so the purpose of LISTEN is trying to uh, stable line source impedance because once you do a test, you have to make sure everybody has exactly the same input source. That's extremely hard to do. So in this case, people put a LISTEN, a network there, so in front of between the source and the equipment under test so that every source will be overwhelmed by the listen, so the adapter or, or the, the equipment on the test always see the same source impedance. In that case, the test can be standardized. And then this, uh, the listen also isolated uh, isolation of power source noise because you're trying to measure a noise source. You try to measure noise. That noise comes from your equipment, not you want to make sure everything come from the source is filled out, so you don't measure the source noise. <clears throat> and it also provides a safe connection for the measuring equipment. Um, generally, is done through an EMI receiver. And uh, so, so if you look at this thing, so you connect your source through a listen to your uh, equipment and the test, finally to your load. And then the, the, the listen comes out two testing points. And these two testing points internally has an impedance of one kilo ohm. And then once you connect these connectors to the EMI receiver, the EMI receiver has a 50 ohm terminator so that you can you really see the 50 ohm of impedance through these two uh, through these two resistors. So um, so in that case, we are measuring the total noise coming from the uh, from your equipment under test. Now, it's clearly we are measuring a voltage that explains why the standards cause out uh, a dB microvolt because you are measuring the voltage. Okay. And then let's take a look at how the listen works. Um, so, so if you look at it, if you look at it, the the power source. So this L1 and L2 connect to your power source, so it provides the power through those two large inductors. So that provides you the power pass. And then your equipment is going to create some EMI noise. So you're going to create noise. So because of this inductance and this capacitance, so you force a so-called high pass filter. So if you look at a gain curve, so the I noise that's coming from here, versus I total, that's this current. So you can see at a high frequency, the gain equal to one means all the currents are flowing through these passes, okay? And uh, when the frequency is below certain frequency, okay, that's well below your, uh, your measured frequency. So you start to see the gain start to roll off. That means the noise, the, the, the noise can pass through to the front, not go through the measurement pass. So the listen is really a high pass filter, so it traps all the high frequency noise caused by the equipment into this pass, and then you can measure the voltage, which is measure the noise current. So, so you really, so so in that case, you are really measure the noise currents forced through the 50 ohm load. Okay. Now let's go back to look at the uh, the standout again, trying to see, say, let's give an example question, say, uh, quasi-peak conduction limit is uh, 60 dB microvolt at 10 megahertz. What is the current level at this level? What we call that microampels or dB microampels. So how do we measure what is the, what is the current level? So here's the answer, how do you do that? So we say the noise is called the 60 dB microvolt. So first we translate the dB microvolts back to the microvolt. This is by uh, divided by 60 by 20 and then 10 to to the that. So that's uh, 10 to the three, so that's a thousand. So that's give you a one millivolt, which means at this particular case, your noise should be less than one millivolt. 
And as we discussed earlier, this one millivolt is really um, the noise current flows through a 50 ohm resistor. So that means your noise current is really only 20 microamperes. And then the, <clears throat> the noise then go to a 20 microamperes. You can translate 20 microamperes to dB microamperes go through the log equation. So that's give you the the 20, uh, 26 dB microamperes. So that's how you translate from the noise and uh, noise amplitudes from voltage to current. And uh, you also notice that that current is extremely small. So basically, you need to uh, attenuate your noise to go to an extremely low level. So a tiny bit of noise will cause your EMI problem. <clears throat> Another another concept earlier we described is the is the is, through look at these two lines we have two lines called quasi peak and average what does that mean so so the EMI detector if you get a EMI detector they actually have three settings it's called peak detector <coughs> quasi peak and average so what what does that that mean to the to the uh, to the measurements so here I give you out uh, three equivalent circuits of the peak, quasi-peak, and average. So in the peak, what it does is is really a peak detector. So you see a diode and a capacitor. So every time the capacitor can only be charged, can never be discharged unless you turn on the switch. So this this basically says you stay, you let the filter stay at one frequency, and then. The, the noise keeps comes, so you keep getting the higher and the higher, then you measure the maximum value of it, so that's the peak value. So you show the switch to discharge it, then you can ready to measure the next uh, the next peak value. And then the quasi-peak, um, let's look at the average first. So the average is really, you put in a, a average filter, so RC average filter. So what you get is the average value of the noise. And then the quasi peak is somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the middle. So you you have a capacitor, you still have a peak peak detector. However, you get a resistor in parallel with the capacitor that give a discharge time. So basically, if you adjust the time constant between the average and quasi peak, they can interchange, interchange, right? So so that'll give you a different um, different value or different um, different property of the noise. Here I give uh, two examples of a noise. So one noise comes fairly frequently, fairly frequently because the duty cycle is relatively small. So the, no the average value is pretty low. So if you use average detector, you have a very low average value. And then, oops, the peak value is really just the highest value is regardless how frequently the noise comes. You see the quasi peak in this case because the noise comes relatively frequently, so the noise level, the quasi peak noise level is fairly high, so it's closer to the to the quasi uh, to the peak value. Well, if the noise comes very infrequently, so in that case, so the because the quasi peak has the long discharge time, so you get time to discharge then the quasi-peak value is closer to the average value. So the original concept of introduce the quasi-peak is trying to trying to get a, a, a so-called annoying factor. Say say if you get a church bell is is really loud, but it only comes every hour. So you don't feel that's that annoying. But if you have something in your home and uh, keep making noise, even though the, lo the noise is not that loud, but it comes all the time, is a lot more annoying compared with the church bell. So in, so in that case, that's why there is an introduction of a quasi-peak that really uh, tells people how noisy this system it is. Okay, so... So given we understand the, how the EMI noise is measured, let's look at how the, the EMI noise was generated. So in a converter, I give two examples, a bug and boost. So they create EMI noise. So the EMI noise generally can separate, separate into two categories. We call that differential modes or DM noise, or the common modes, common CM noise. 
the the DM noise here from this name is differential. So basically, the current flows through different directions. So give an example of a, of a, a buck. So you can see the current on the high side, you see the current flow to the right, and on the return pass, the current flow to the left. So the current flows on different passes. So that's the main current that flows to deliver the power. So that's the current you cannot avoid, okay? And the current mode, could, by the name, so, so the, the current flow in the same direction. Let's give an example, say your switch node coupled through a parasitic capacitor generator current. So this current will all come back to the switch node. So that's the blue line flows a pass that go back to the switch node. So all these currents are flowing to the right, so they have the same directions. So they're called common mode. The same, the same thing you can see on the boost converter. So you can see the differential mode and the common mode current. So once you do the, the layout, you really, once you see, once you're doing the layouts, you're trying to minimize the noise, you, you will see the differential mode noise is really, you cannot avoid because they deliver the power. So you have to live with it. In that case, you have to try to figure out a way to minimize all those high DI by DT current loops. So to create, to, to reduce how much noise you will, you will create. And uh, once you start to deal with the common mode noise, you're trying to see how I might be able to control the capacitance. So you're trying to say, hey, can I make the PCB smaller? Can I make the shielding layers so that current mode currents can flow not into the ground? So those are the uh, uh, typical techniques you can implement to control the differential mode and common mode noise. So by, by property, the differential mode noise is more of a current driven. Like I said, it's a, it's a power delivery part, so it's a current driven, and it generally has a very high DI by TT, like you switch your sw sw turn off your switch, the current from a high current back to zero, so you have very high current DI by DT, and then you create a magnetic field. You have a, a relatively strong field, so you want to control the, the loop area to be minimized, so to, to reduce the magnetic field. And uh, because you deliver the power, so you have a low impedance pass to transfer the, uh, to transfer the power. And the uh, common mode noise is different because it comes through the the parasitic capacitance is generally voltage driven, so it's more like an electric field. So it has relatively high dV by dt. So the dV by dt goes through a capacitor, it creates a common mode current. So, so we can see because it's a parasitic capacitance, so you have relatively high impedance and, uh, um, and you, you control the, by the controlling the capacitance. Okay. So first, let's take a look at the differential mode noise. So differential mode noise is, uh, is your power delivery pass. So it's generally your differential mode current is essentially the current you use to deliver power. So or say your input current of your system. Okay, so as an example of a flyback, you can see this current is a trapezoidal. A lot of times you see a converter like a, a buck, a boost, the input current is either a trapezoidal or triangular shape. So so in that case, you can easily get your current shape come from either your measurements or come from your theoretical analysis or simulation. You know what a shape it is. And once you do the EMI designs or, 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 or EMI filter designs, you can easily represent, replace this current by a current source. And then you put the rest of the circuit into an equivalent circuit. Now you get your equivalent circuits of your EMI transferring pass. And then you can design your EMI filters based on this uh, uh, EMI noise source. So that's your source. And then once you go to the frequency domain, you can separate, you can, you can do a quick Fourier analysis and try to do a, a trapezoidal shape into a spectrum waveform, okay? So, so here I give an example, a trapezoidal shape with 50% duty cycle, switching at 100 kilohertz uh, from one ampere to two ampere. So that's a typical uh, flyback converter input current looks like. Um, and a bar converter also could look like this. So if you do a Fourier analysis, here I give you the spectrum. 
So you can see the spectrum generally see a, a slope, a down slope. So that down slope gives you a 20 dB per decade slope. So every time you see a, a, a EMI measurement, you see a shape looks like this without the EMI filter. If you see a shape looks like that, you give you a concept like the noise you keep reducing sounds like a differential mode noise. So, so, so if you have other power stages, and you can simulate or calculate the input current, you can do the same thing. You can quickly get a rough idea of what kind of EMI spectrum you're going, to net, you're going to get from the differential mode noise. The common mode noise is slightly different because it's, it's less, I'll, I'll use the word tangible, it's less tangible because uh, you, 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 you will have some difficulty to simulate it, but uh, with some analysis, you start to be able to see it. So what you see is the common mode noise generally caused by a, a switch node and coupled through a parasitic capacitor to the ground and flowing back into your input. So if you repre represent the switch node into a, a square wave or a power source, and then the equivalent source, equivalent circuit become this. So your voltage source drive a parasitic capacitor close loop through the listen. As we mentioned earlier, the listen is a high pass filter. So basically all the EMI noise currents will flow through this pass and uh, they are really in common mode. So they are in parallel. So you really can parallel 250 ohm resistor become a 25 ohm resistor. So that'll give you a simple equivalent circuit of a common mode noise, okay? And uh, the same thing, once you see the voltage source, that's a switch node. Generally, the switch node looks like a trapezoidal shape. You have a rise time, you have a fall time. So every time you have a high dV by dt, that dV by dt times c, you get a square current. The same thing, you get a negative slope, you get a negative current. So that'll give you a pulse current. That's the, uh, generally how the common mode noise current looks like. The same thing as a uh, as, uh, um, differential mode noise, we can also do a, a common mode noise uh, spectrum. So I do this time, I do slightly different way and use an equivalent circuit to analyze it. So as we mentioned earlier, this equivalent circuit, the current is generally a trapezoidal voltage source drive on a capacitive impedance, right? So as we said, the capacitance impedance is equal to uh, minus 20 dB per decade slope. So the higher the frequency, the lower the impedance. And uh, the trapezoidal shape has a minus 20 dB per decade slope. And then at the rise time, you start to see another turning point that's a minus 40 dB per decade slope. So you combine these two curves together. So this one divided by that one, then you will get the noise envelope of a common mode noise. So the common mode noise see a very interesting property that shows a very flat, flat envelope at lower frequency, and then start at this corner frequency relate to your rise time. Then you start to see a, a minus 20 dB per decade, so the noise start to reduce. So, so if you do a measurement on a EMI noise and you see a noise spectrum is all flat and pretty high, then you will get a feeling that's probably a common mode noise. So given that, what you can do to improve CM noise? So, so normally I, I do that more interactively when, when I present face to face. So, so here, I'm not sure you can, you can comment on the on the chat, so um, what do you think you can improve the CM noise? Okay, um, <clears throat> in reality, um, so what you can do very clearly because the, the, noise, so the noise is a current, so you can either reduce your source or you can increase your impedance. So there are two ways, you increase your impedance, you limit how much current you're coming from, and you reduce your source so you can limit how much noise you're coming from. So, so in that case, from the noise side, from the impedance side, you can try to say, hey, can I figure out a way to reduce my, my common mode capacitance? Can I reduce this parasitic capacitance? 
So there is a way to do that. You, when you do your layout, you're trying to minimize the corporate area of your switch node so that you minimize this capacitance. That's a very effective way to reduce your common mode noise because now your capacitor is smaller. Now the impedance is higher, so you can reduce your amplitude. Another way of controlling your common mode noise is trying to reduce the source. Because at this area, you, there is not much you can do because you are switching with certain amplitudes, with certain frequency, certain duty cycle, because your power requirement, so you really cannot reduce this. However, you should be able to change the turning point, change the corner frequency. So if I start to make the rise time four times lo longer, so I can push this corner frequency to a lower frequency, re lower frequency, what's going to happen is you're going to start to see the, the slope start to, start to drop here. Now you start to reduce your common mode noise. So those are several ways once you start to looking at the, 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 the source and the impedance, you will come up with all kinds of great ideas trying to reduce your EMI noise. Okay, so the common mode noise and the differential mode noise can be measured. So if we look at this picture, as we, as we mentioned earlier, so on the power transferring path, you are seeing the total current. Okay, so that's the overall current. The differential mode current is flowing different ways. So the differential mode current flowing different ways, and the common mode current flowing both ways. What does that mean? Means on this resistor, you are measuring two currents as up together. Okay. On this resistor, you are measuring this current substrate. So if we are measuring the voltage on both of the resistors, we should be able to do some transformation and get the common mode and differential mode noise. So here gives some simple equations. So if you use the average of these two measurements voltage, you are getting because the differential mode are cancel out. So what you left over are the common mode noise. Or you you use one voltage minus the other voltage, so the two common mode noise are cancelled out, so you left over other differential mode noise. So you are able to separate them. So here in one of the example paper, they give a simple um, reference circuit that use a use a double pole double throw um, switch to switch back and forth to separate the common mode and differential mode noise. So why do we want to separate them? So, so there are two major purposes. You trying to figure out what's your problem. So, so are you having a problem with differential mode noise, or you have your problem with common mode noise? So it helps you to troubleshoot, because you might you might fight him with the wrong problem. You think you have a lot of differential mode no noise. You try to do the filtering, all that. It ends up to be a common mode noise. So it's really less e efficient to debug your EMI noise. And then it also help you to do the EMI filter so you know what kind of noise you get from the differential mode side, from the common mode side. Then you can you can define define your EMI filter appropriately for for certain for certain noise. Okay. So talking about the EMI noise, uh for talking about the EMI filter here, I I show the very basic EMI filter uh design. So it's a LC filter. So the LC filter shows a, a, a property that what I, what I show is the transfer gain of this EMI filter or insertion loss, what people call it. So what it has is basically your, um, sorry, I, I made a mistake. I think it should be I measure divided by I source. So it's here divided by del. So what does that mean? means um, the gain at the low frequency, you let the power or let the current all pass through. So, so that all your current, all your low frequency current, which is main your power delivering current, can pass through this filter without causing too much trouble. And then at higher frequency, what we call this turning point is a corner frequency, you start to give attenuation. So less noise all trapped into the capacitor and less noise, more noise trapped in the capacitor and less noise pass through the inductor. So, so you can see the corner frequency is the resonant frequency over L and C. It, this is because uh, um, 
at this point, the impedance of L and C equal to each other. Once you go even higher, so the the inductor has higher free, higher impedance compared with the capacitor. So so the current goes to the lower impedance pass. So that start to give you the attenuation. So often you will find out some cases that one stage is not enough. You can start adding more stages that changes your slope. So once you have another another LC stage, so now you're adding minus 40 dB to minus 80 dB. So that gives you a sharper attenuation, so give you more attenuation to the system. So in this case, I give an example. You have L and C are exactly the same. Two stages are exactly the same. So you have a corner frequency are exactly the same. But if you have two stages are not the same, what's going to happen? So, so the reason I particularly want to have a two different, later we'll see why we want to have a two different stage. But if you have a two different stage, basically you're going to start from somewhere and you're going to hit the first corner frequency and start to go with a minus 40 dB per decade attenuation. And then after that, uh, you hit the second corner frequency and then you start to start to go down with minus 80 dB per decade. So, so that'll give you a different, uh, um, different ways of attenuation. Sometimes you need a, a, a lot of attenuation so that you can use uh, multiple stages to help filter out more noise. And uh, so far, we talk about EMI noise. Everything looks uh, very ideal. But in reality, those uh, inductors or capacitors are not ideal components. Here, I show you one of the example EMI filter uh, inductor. So in the schematic, it shows as a as an inductor, but in reality, you have uh, copper wires. So the wire has some impedance, have some uh, resistive loss. So when you design your EMI filter inductor, you often try to say, "Hey, this all my power flows through these wires. So I want to make sure I have relatively low uh, resistance." or called the equivalent series resistance, or ESR. So I want to control that resistance so I don't create a lot of loss. And then, because you want to crown the core, so the core will create some core loss, so that also represented by a parallel resistance. Furthermore, if you look at the wires, so all the wires are paralleling with each other. So from wire to wire, there is be parasitic capacitance. What does that mean? Means before you were thinking, hey, the inductor is a simple inductor. Actually, in a, in a <clears throat> more reality, it has resistive loss and it has capacitive pass. So if you measure the impedance of this inductor at certain frequency, this inductor is no longer inductor; it becomes a capacitor. So here I do one of the measurements. You can see I, I measure this inductor from the um, 10 kilohertz to I think is uh, from 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz. So you can see this is the impedance curve. So if we, if we have an inductor, we see the positive 20 dB per decade slope <coughs> and the phase at 90 degrees. So that looks like an inductor. But at this point, you see the slope change to minus dB minus 20 dB per decade. So the phase also goes to the uh, minus 90 degree. So what this mean means at this frequency range, it's not really, it, this is not inductor anymore, this become a capacitor. So the currents can directly transfer through this path. So you are not dealing with uh, uh, inductor anymore. So that's a very important concept. You, you design your EMI filter for certain frequency, after that frequency, you cannot rely on this EMI filter anymore. So sometimes we rely on the core loss, sometimes we rely on the uh, resistive loss. That will also help you to provide some attenuation, even though they are not as effective as a real EMI filter, a real LC filter. The same thing for capacitor, you can do the same thing, and uh, you think it's a capacitor, and then you will have series resistors, the ESR, with the capacitor when the current flows through it. And uh, you will have ESL. Once you open up this capacitor, often you will see that one bit used uh, um, like the electric tapes. <clears throat> 
to have two plates parallel together. So they will create ESL, and then you will have leakage current. So you have a equivalent circuit very similar to your inductor. So at certain frequency, this capacitor is no longer a capacitor too. So so what you see is the same impedance curve that you can see at the beginning. It is a capacitor. You have minus 20 dB per decade slope. But after you have the resonant frequency of the L and C, you start to change to your inductor. So, so at this frequency, you are no longer a capacitor anymore. So in that case, after a certain point, you, you have to find another way. That's why earlier I will introduce two stages of EMI filters. So you can say, hey, at if I have a inductor or capacitor have relatively large values, their resonant frequency can be relatively low. So at certain frequency range, they are no longer filtered. But if I have a smaller LC component, their resonant frequency can be higher. Then I can have a higher frequency that are still a filter. So you can, you can use a two different stages, one EMI, handle the low frequency noise, one EMI filter handle the high frequency noise, so you can have some, some tools to play around. Okay, so besides the, those are a very simple, we call that differential mode filter, and then for the common mode noise, how do we handle the filter? So here it's the same thing I draw equivalent circuits. As we mentioned earlier, if you want to reduce the EMI noise, one, you can control the source, or you can control the impedance. So what you can do is you can insert the impedance in the loop so that you can reduce the EMI noise. So what this impedance trying to do is because the current flows through this impedance, so you do not want this impedance all the time because you have high currents flowing through it. So for the high current, you do not want the impedance. You just want the impedance for the differential mode current. So there is a device called Calm Mode Inductor has exactly the property we wanted here. So if you look at this uh, inductor called, made by the toroid, okay? So if you use a differential mode noise, the current flows at two different directions. So the high side ones go to a, a field, go to this way, and low side one, you go to the angle, you go to the field also go uh, the node go this way, so you also go this way. So these two magnetic fields cancel out each other, so you don't have many fields left. Okay, so so what you do is you cancel them out each other. So and Bing, then, sorry, sorry for interruption, but we have yes. two questions already in our list. Do you want to go through them or you want to keep them toward the end? Okay, so sorry, I, I missed that. So let's. Let's go to Let the, me share first, the one. first question. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll type it down for everyone so you can. Yeah, I, I see the first question is, uh, um, is the user function generator and the signal, uh, function generator, a signal, signal injector and a signal for measurements, is that referring to Is that refer sorry, when did that question ask what which page was that referring to? So it it was asked at one twenty. Uh it showed on my system late. Uh but I, I believe you were still in the middle of the presentation toward the, the early. Some of you okay. can we can ask the person who asked to ask again. There's another question we have. Uh I can you can go to the second question and we can come back to the first question toward the end of the session. Here's right. the second question. So the second question is: Is there a good uh, generic approach to differ differentiate between parasitic effects for common mode noise, or even find the dominant noise source if both common mode noise and differential mode noise are, are problematic? So, um, so. This is really a three things. So we first we're talking about parasitic effects come from the EMI filter. So those that's one thing. So basically that's talking about your EMI filter is less effective. Like I showed here at this area, your EMI filter is definitely less effective. So that's one problem. And then the other problem is the common mode noise. 
and differential mode noise, like we showed here. So you have you have the noise from the common mode noise and differential mode noise. So they, if they are both uh, both problematic, you have to figure out a way. You can have to tackle them one by one. So you have to solve the differential mode noise and common mode noise separately. So you will design the differential mode EMI field for the for the differential mode noise and the de design the common mode field for the common mode field uh, for the common mode noise. I just don't see a very good way. Say you can tackle them all at once. So you you just have to have to separate them, um, do them separately. Okay. So um, next one is the how the three-phase cone mode inductor works. So let me finish the cone mode uh, noise, uh, cone mode inductor, and then we can discuss how three-phase works. Okay, so let's go back. So we're talking about insert impedance in the cone mode noise path. So for the cone mode, noise, cone mode inductor, you can see you have uh, uh, one you flow through the differential mode current. Those two currents generate a magnetic field, cancel out with each other. So equivalent, to you don't have an inductor there. Then the current, differential mode current can flow through with some li some leakage. <clears throat> so that's exactly what you want. You want your uh, your power path has no impedance in the middle. However, once you have uh, um, have the three, once you have the cone mode current. So all three common mode currents are flowing at exactly the same direction. So the common mode go, current go this way and go this way. They create uh, they create as up the the common mode noise. So in that case, they all filter out. So they make the field stronger. Basically, these two windings are coupled tightly with each other. So that creates a, a extremely large magnetic field and mag large magneti magnetizing current. So it has very large currents of very large inductance for the common mode noise, but very little inductance for the differential mode noise. So you can you can use that for the for the uh, filtering purpose. So that inductor gives you increased impedance. Then you can start to add capacitors because if you add capacitor to ground, now you form a, a filter. You are not only um, you are not only um, Increase the impedance. You also shunt the current from the um, from the system to the uh, to the capacitor. So you, the common mode noise will will shunt through these capacitors, so that you form a filter that's become more effective. So if you have place, or if you, if you're allowed to put the common mode capacitors, they can help you to boost the gain or, or, or attenuation of the EMI filter. But if you have the only place or only allow to put common mode inductance that still have have the effect because you impede, increase the impedance and reduces the um, reduces the common mode current so the same concept can be transferred to the three um, three phase because once you have a three phase system generally those three phase um, current as up together equal to zero that's one case. So that's a lot of cases. Three-phase current adds up together, like you connect with the star connections. So three-phase current connect together. So in that case, if they flow on on the on the differential mode direction, you should be still be able to create a magnetic field that adds up together equal to zero. And then I would imagine they will have the tone mode noise will go through the same direction, so they they will become the same direction, and they don't cancel out each other. They go to the same direction, so they will give you the cone mode inductor exactly the same way as here. So you create a three-phase inductor. So you then create you can a. Can, can you close the, the box toward the end? Oh, this box. Sorry. The, the right, so, so they can see the. Okay. Sorry, uh, that, that's my bad. Okay, so so with the with the three phase uh, with the three phase, they still cancel out each other. So that that a different way. So in the on the single phase, you have to use your current and the return current. For the three phase, you go to three phase A, phase B, phase C. So the three current automatic adds up equal to each other. Okay, so there are a couple more questions. I think people are really interested in the common mode inductor. If you use three phase, okay. why? Yeah, go ahead. Finish the point because we have a couple of questions in the queue. So tell me when you're done, and we can move into the next question. Okay. 
So if you use a three-phase Y configure four wire CM inductor by only using line-to-line -line configuration, does this affect the filtering ability is four four wire CM in CM inductor? I think I think that's that depends on I really want to think about you can use it or not, because now you have four wires, that means you might have cu current goes to the fourth wire. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, line to line config, not using the neutral line. So in that case, I really don't think that that fourth wire is useless because there's no current flowing through it. So you can leave it open. I, I don't think it's really uh, reduced the effectiveness, but but you, 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 you reduce its effectiveness in the in, in indirect way because you put the put the inductor in a toroid, so that winding takes space, but not doing anything. So you are wasting that space. You actually can put more wires in other three windings, so you can increase the cone mode inductance and provide more attenuation. Okay. So okay. there is a. So maybe, go ahead. There is another question, say, there is another, is there a rule of thumb to determine the inductance and capacitance values? So, um, so generally, these capacitance are called Y cap that connects from your power line to the earth ground. So a lot of safety agency will limit this current, like uh, uh, they will say, because you will touch it, you will feel it. So there are some extreme cases like your cell phones. People are insist you cannot put capacitor there because your your face will feel feel the uh, tingling. So they don't want it. Um, so that's that's annoyed. I I think I have to go go on because we have ten more minutes. I I, I have quite a few slides need to finish. I'll pause the okay. answer question uh, here. You, you can go ahead. There is one question, so it's up to you when you want to answer it. I got to write it down. I'm not sure if you went over it already. It was passed by the host. Uh, right. that, that's what I have on my list. That's the last one, okay. but you can go ahead. Okay. I'll go ahead, and uh, we'll, we'll answer the question before we can, after we finish the presentation. Okay. So um, the cone mode inductor equivalent circuit, so I show you the equivalent circuit of cone mode inductor, so you will have uh, um, the same thing. You will have ideal transformer with the magnetizing inductor, so that's your cone mode inductor. And then you will have leakage inductance, and then you will have ESR. The same thing because of wires, you will have parallel capacitors, and uh, you will have parallel resistors for the core loss. Okay. So the cone mode inductor actually have different ways of construction. Here I show three ways of construct a cone mode inductor. So the left hand shows a bifiler, so you see two different colors. Uh, they go in parallel, bifiler go parallel. So in this case, they are these two wires are coupled really well, so you have less differential mode impedance and you have high capacitance coupling because they are go paralleling and they have very little leakage inductance. So this type of inductors are actually used for data lines, sensors, those places where you want to transfer, but you want the common mode filter, but you do not want to lose your signal. So you cannot have a lot of leakage inductance that affects your behavior. In, in actually, in power supplies, you like that leakage inductance because that leakage inductance become part of your differential mode filter. So in this case, you see they called sectional uh, filter. So you see you, they put two windings, you two different sections. So this this approach will give you low capacitance coupling. That that the, so the high frequency noise has less chance to transfer directly from one line to the other, and also it gives you high leakage inductance, then you can use the uh, leakage inductance as the, as the differential mode filter inductance. So once you put that, you can put the equivalent circuit of a standard pi filter. So you see the differential mode, uh, cone mode filter, you have LCM and C11, C12, and then you have a differential mode filter, CX1, CX2, and this. And then once you look at differential mode, so, uh, sorry, I, I do one step further, so I simplify the listen to a, a 50 ohm resistor, and then you can do the differential mode, just ignore the common mode noise, the common mode inductor by, represented by uh, leakage inductance. And then those two capa Y capacitors become two series caps. 
And then once you go to the define, uh, common mode noise, you really see the common mode inductor by its magnetizing inductance, and then you just fold the bottom to the top, so the uh, common mode, uh, differential mode capacitors are gone. Those two common mode capacitors are in parallel. Like I mentioned earlier, this capacitor flows the current to the ground, and that's generally a safety ground. So people want to control how much leakage currents go through those capacitors, so there are safety agency requirements for how large the capacitor can be. Okay. So how do we design a EMI filter? As we mentioned earlier, you can measure raw noise and then separate them to differential mode noise and the common mode noise. And then you say, hey, at this particular point, I need some attenuation to meet my standard requirements. Then I can say, I can design a EMI filter that gives me so much attenuation at that particular frequency, okay? Because the EMI filter generally again keep goes down, so uh, the, the attenuation goes more and more, so that tells you you will have no trouble to filter the later EMI noises Unless, until the point where the EMI filter is no longer EMI filter, you start to find you start fighting with the EMI filter parasitics. Okay. So the last slides I want to explain is the uh, other techniques, is the spread spectrum. So what is it? So as we do a fixed frequency, all your EMI noise is concentrated at one particular frequency and is very high and very concentrated. For a lot of switching modes, power supply topologies, you are able to change the switching frequency without affecting the converter behavior like a bar converter, your output voltage is controlled by duty cycle, so the frequency is not that critical. So in that case, you can change your frequency around for a while. So once you start to spread spectrum, what's the effect is because the EMI, fill, EMI detector only sees a finite amount of noise for a certain frequency band. So if you make your noise out of that band, so the detector won't be able to see it, then the noise becomes lower. So that's one technique is being widely used today in different uh, switching mode power supplies. Okay, so it reduces overall current, overall the noise. However, um, you you reduce the peak while widening the spectrum. So if you have a, um, if you have a case that you have a, a very high noise, and then you spread out a little bit. So generally, this technique will give you several dB of noise reduction. And this is not going to, say, replace your EMI filter. This will give you a little tool that make your life slightly easier. So given that, uh, here's a summary of this presentation. So the EMI noise is uh, created with the power, switching mode power supply. So you can measure the noise, use a listen, and you can separate the noise by the differential mode and common mode noise. And uh, you can mitigate the EMI noise with the EMI filtering. And uh, you can measure the noise, and then you design your EMI filter to provide the attenuation you need it. So that's all for the presentation portion of it. So I think we have uh, one more minute to, to answer the question. So, all right. So, yeah, let go me... ahead for the last question and give me like 30 seconds toward the end. Okay, so the last question is there a good generic approach to differentiate um, parasitic field effects for common mode noise, even find dominant noise source if both CM and DM are problematic? I think I, I did address this question earlier that the, um, the parasitic effects and differential mode and common mode noise are different problems. So, so you, you don't mix them together. So the, you have a common mode noise, you either address it at a source, change the slope, change your driving speeds, or uh, change your parasitic capacitance, or, you, or differential mode noise, so you try to, try to change the other topology, change your operation modes of converter to reduce your differential mode noise. But the parasitic effects really, uh, really has to address the, through the EMI filter instead of uh, address to your uh, common mode and differential mode noise. There is no, there is no way, um, there is one easy way you can differentiate them, you can remove your EMI filter, 
So there is no parasitic effect, so you can directly see cone mode and differential mode. Then, then you can address the, those issues separately. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you, Bing. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I think I have last question. We're just running out of time, so we have to wait until next time. Or you can answer the, ask the question um, later to the E2E or some, some other forum. Yeah. Yes, sure. And, and, and just to highlight, thank, thank you, Bing, for a really great presentation. And just to highlight, we have an approach which is E2E, engineer to engineer, on TI.com, where you can come in and ask some questions. We definitely can help you there. And keep in mind, many of our reference designs on the web take in consideration the EMI concerns. And for some of them, we actually post out our EMI performance uh, if it's related uh, to the device. So overall, thank you everyone for joining the for joining us today. All session records and presentation will be available to view later this week on ti.com forward slash high voltage seminar. Uh, we you will also receive an email with a link to the on demand presentation and uh, a post event survey. We would like your feedback so we can continue to improve our content for future seminars. So thank you again and have a great rest of your day. Uh, I will post the link for the seminar and the uh, and the slide in the chat right now before we end. All right, thank you.